So, um, I think, uh, so thank you all for, for staying. It was a slight delay. I didn't want to uh, um, it did interrupt the uh, discussion, but now we have uh, Milo still with us and he will talk um, about his work. He, we mentioned in the afternoon when it came to the book presentation and everything, but now he will show excerpts or trailers as one say, and uh, in a kind of free floating way, right? Uh, uh, give us a comment, a director's cut, but live. Um, in a way. So Bailey, um, are you ready over there? Okay, so we start with Congo. So um, Emila, what's what is Congo all about? I mean, I never know which trailer will be shown because every project has a lot of trailers. So I will be surprised by what, what is shown by the, but perhaps it's just the cinema, uh, the trailer from the, from the documentary from the cinema. Ah, yes, I guess so. And um, so this is, I think in the trailer you will see it, it's a tribunal we did uh, first in 2015 in the Eastern Congo. And it's the experiments to have um, um, a tribunal for world economy. So the tribunal in a way is like a setting of a trial on a stage as if it were a re real trial with a prosecutor, judge, um, um, a jury, um, and following the procedure of a real trial, that's a tr tribunal, right? And uh, and uh, absolutely, and uh, it's always based on very concrete cases and on people involved in these cases. So in that uh, in that case, it's uh, about I think a gold mine of Benro, which is a Canadian uh, um, enterprise, and then uh, and. And, 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 and two other cases. So one massacre in, in, a, in a little city called Mutarula in the eastern part of, of, of Congo. I mean, there you have a mix of ethnical conflicts, of conflicts for land and raw materials, of, it's also called an international, it's called, it's called the Third World War because China and US and the European Union are, and, and the, the countries around are involved for the fight for this this, this raw materials, for example, uh, concerning Coltane, you have 80% of what is on this planet there. And it's the most important strategic uh, raw material that exists in uh, uh, in this century because of the IT industry. And I mean, you all know this story. So tell a bit about the massacre of what happened. Um, I, I um, When you come to the east of Congo, then you will, of course, uh, meet the... It's the it's the biggest uh, uh, blue helmet uh, United Nations troops there. Uh, it's like they, they they invest one billion a year, um, but the war is going on because it's a super complex war, and this war is connected, to, of course, to the to the raw materials, to the mines, and uh, who helps whom. Sometimes these militias are linked to an enterprise. Sometimes they are independent, etc. And I remember I came there, and the first thing they tell you, because if not, they can't, can't exploit, they say, okay, it's a post-conflict zone. But then wherever you go, you will see massacres, you will be involved in massacres, you will come after a massacre, before a massacre. It's really, it's really happening all the time. And the film we did, and my kind of, 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 of start of the interest was when I was working in, in Rwanda, I was going to the east of Congo, and I was just wanting to, to take some images to then finance the, 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 the project. And I was involved in this, it's Massacre in Mutarule. And we were kind of forced by the villagers to film for 10 hours, like everything. You witnessed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I was asking myself, um, but why did this happen? And then of course we, we found out together with the advocates and everybody and uh, and people involved that this village is uh, on the land they should not be there because it's on the land that they want to exploit at one point. And what happens many times that these conflicts are are pushed again and again until the people just leaves. That then they could say, okay, because it's difficult to, 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 to bring them away from these concessions. So, and the film starting from this massacre tries to tell the, the the connections between a random massacre because they happen all the time 
and the bigger picture of the of the of this what I call the third world war. So this this economical war for uh, the access to this to these materials. So um, let's um, uh, watch it. And also I, in the book, Milo talks about this kind of the, the what is the moment you get involved with the war? When do you do something? I think you in the book you talk about this when you saw this. You said I have to do something, even though I live in a different space. Even though it's not my family, it's not my tribe, it's not my country. I have to do something. We are connected and we are all implicated um, in a way, as you uh, also wrote in, in Matera, um, the uh, uh, Christ who ended up playing. He saw one of his co-workers dying from heat uh, in in on the uh, tomato plantations. Nobody was allowed to help him. And um, and he said, this is wrong. And he organized the very first strike um, ever in the history you know, of Italy against a, a mafia-run organization. So let's uh, watch the Congo Tribunal and then talk a little bit about it. It's three minutes. Three. Yeah. Jamais dire le nom. Jamais dire d'où tu viens. Pas nommer d'autres noms. Mesdames et messieurs, levez-vous les tribunaux là. Vous êtes le ministre de l'Intérieur. Pourquoi êtes-vous arrivé si tard Les événements se passent la nuit. Peux-tu nous affirmer que sa police à lui ne travaille que la journée Les entreprises multinationales ont-elles profité de l'instabilité politique pendant les 20 années de guerre Ce qui se passe autour de moi n'est pas acceptable. Pour qui me prend-on pour accepter ça Pour qui nous nous prend-on pour accepter ça Um, you have the documentary of the theater performance, but you also make a film. Yeah, it's not 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 really a theater performance. It's really a, uh, film. It's mm -hmm. really a tribunal. I mean, um, and the tribunal exists until today. Uh, it was made several times in different Four countries. Times. Yes, and uh, the last time in Corvée, we've seen the end. I think a little excerpt of justice. So we continue to work on this project for ten years, perhaps. Um, and uh, and uh, 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 this film, I mean, we made for several reasons. Um, a bit like we did the film about the Moscow trials. One, one reason is always to finance these kind of projects that nobody would ever finance through film money. This is uh, this is one reason, because you have to stage it to then film it, and then you can, of course, pay it by film money. On the other side, uh, this uh, the fact that you would film because this was staged in the civil war region in a in a region that is is a bit unsafe, and to film it helps a lot to 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 secularize it that that everything is filmed, um, and uh, and the last thing is of course to to have a documentation of it because what this we 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 then made uh, around two thousand copies I think. And these copies were spread by by one of the prosecutors. Um, that is uh, one extremely important uh, human human rights lawyer in in Congo. So he would then bring it to a lot of 
other lawyers that take it as a as a as a toolbox to start to do these tribunals too to in the end and this is the hope of course to 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 construct a kind of a of a of a, of a real state uh, uh, institution out of it so that the the, the guy with the mustache in the end Jean Louis Gilizen, he's one of the creators of the tribunal of Den Hague, uh, which is uh, uh, and 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 for me there is one anecdote he told me because he's a he's he's just a lawyer from uh, from Liège, which is a little town in in Belgium, um, and he's absolutely not an exceptional person. He's just a lawyer, and uh, he told me when in the conference of Rome he was presenting with some colleagues the first time the idea of making an international uh, tribunal for human rights in Den Hague, which became now the model for. The institutional model for all these kind of tribunals, you know, they had the, they had the, uh, Milosevic, they had Karacic, they had the 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 the, 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 the mass killers from Rwanda. They had, I mean, it really became an institution. And um, and he told me, you know, Milo, um, when I was presenting this as a young lawyer, they were saying, but there is no legal basis, and there is no money uh, to do it. And ten years later, they had a legal basis. They had one billion, and they created the, the Den Hague Tribunal. And just because, like, five people decided to do so, and not extraordinary people, and not rich people, just lawyers. Um, and it's a very utopian space, the tribunal, you know. And justice, for me in my work, or I think, is like beauty, or like love, or like 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 these kind of things, like reason, um, a basic human instinct. Um, and I'm, I'm also talking as an artist. When you do a play based on, on, on justice and on truth, everybody immediately understands. Everybody immediately accepts and respects it. And this is beautiful. So that's why institutions function. Um, and of course, a tribunal is also a possibility to, on a stage not bigger than this one, represent for example, world economy, to explain why these people in Mutarule are killed by a company that is based in uh, in Canada or in Switzerland, or how this is, I mean, not directly, but how it is linked, how this structural violence of world economy functions. Um, and to bring it together in a kind of a comedy men of, 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 of what world economy is. Because you know that most, when I was studying sociology, there was the cliche that you could not represent big structures. Uh, it was not the cliche because it's also true. But when I found this format, which is not a format I, I of course, invented because it exists since, since ever, uh, since the beginning of tragedy, you have the tribunal as the model, the model perhaps of Western dramaturgy. Um, and it makes it representable. It makes it, it gives even a structure, it gives even attention, you know, to the, the, the verdict in the end, gives the tension. So you have a lot of, of things and that's why it functions as a film and why you can tell it as a film. Um, while a lot of theater plays, when you make a film out of Chekhov, it makes absolutely no sense. Because this is really a stage experience that will not work in the logic of of film or television, uh, but the tribunal does. And I like uh, also what you wrote in the book. You said it's not actually about the verdict when it comes at the end, sometimes even slightly, you know, non climactic. It, but the process, as you said, the uh, in your idea of the um, the global reality, it becomes reality. The demonstration of something that's fundamentally wrong also shows. It can be changed because there is about systems and mechanisms and not individual um, fate. Um, and, um, and this is a, an, an incredible reinvention or retaking of the future. And you always said the work of uh, the theater is that you take utopias also from the past and you let them light up again, let them you know, sprout and take what always has been there into, um, into, into a, a future. What changed um, since you started those trials. Now four of them have been, and also in Switzerland, I think, in Switzerland, where the company actually has the headquarters. So what changed uh, in the context? I think it became part of global consciousness, right? 
um, um, how to say, I think, I mean, comparing it perhaps to the, the, the Moscow trials and how Moscow changed since, since 10 years and this, uh, which was a bit later, but also 10 years ago, this, these images you saw. So Eastern Congo, Russia become worse, as we all know, um, and, uh, and Eastern Congo stayed bad. But it's not worse or better. It's really the same situation. There is no justice. There is a complete independence, legal independence from the big companies. There is, we try to push, and that's why we did one of these, these tribunals in Switzerland. We try to help to push one law that would make um, big uh, transnational uh, companies uh, chargeable in, for example, Switzerland. Because they are based in Switzerland, they pay taxes in Switzerland, so they would, which is not possible now. So if you are killed in Mutarula, you can go buy this, com or somehow buy this company, however, you can even not investigate it in Switzerland. It's impossible. Um, and I think that's what is pushed in France and in perhaps in the US too, I don't know, uh, by the United Nations and also by uh, a lot of national initiatives in different countries. And um, of course, we support this a lot in Switzerland and in France and in Germany, and, and uh, it will come perhaps in five years, in 10 years. I was, I was always, you know, when you look back to the 19th century, then you can be impressed with the technical possibilities that they had to change place, or they didn't even have the train. When they invented the nation, the nation of France was bigger than the globe is today for us. So I'm now in New York, and tomorrow at the same time I will be in Cologne. Um, and, um, and, uh, but why didn't our consciousness, our legal system, our etc not grow after the invention of the nation. Why was it over with the invention of the nation? I don't know, I don't understand it, you know? And that's why I think it will grow, and it will grow during this, this, this generation. It will be, a, as it's called, progressive justice, and it will come, you're part of it, and you're actually part of implementing the change. Maybe we go, um, and we talk about it more, but later to the next um, um, trailer. We talked about it this afternoon. Maybe may Milo say one, two sentences about it. Uh, one stop for Bailey. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the new gospel, I, I think. It's a bit uh, asynchronic because I think then we go back and then we go forth again with you, but who cares? It's nice. And uh, it's not really asynchronic because we changed so much the, the, the place on the planet. Um, but this is uh, this is a project we did um, in 2019-2020 uh, in the city of Matera, and the city of Matera is very known in film history because it's the city where the big Jesus film were made, and especially of course in the 60s, the film by Italian director Pier Paolo Pasolini, and he did a film that became very influential on European filmmaking. In his, it's called the New Realistic Style. So he, he, he worked with non-professionals, he worked with this kind of camera that became, you know, this kind of painting, slow-cut camera uh, that became very influential for Art House movie until today. But it's, it's very direct too. And, uh, and it became in Europe, we had every year the capital of culture. And it's almost always a very sad peripheric city, but this year it was... Uh, Matera, and we are touring a lot with our place in Italy. And uh, and then they were calling me and saying, okay, why would you not do a, a play for us? And I said, so yeah, but I would like to do a Jesus film, the, the city of Jesus film. And then they said, so yeah, okay. And um, and I called some actors from, ah, Mel Gibson, American director, he did another Jesus film, The Passion of the Christ, also in Matera, very different, of course, from the from the film by Pasolini, and I was asking the Holy Mary of Mel Gibson, Maya Morgenstern, an actress I know very well, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the Jesus of Pasolini, Enrique Rozzotti, who died, meanwhile, um, to, to be in my film. I went there, and then I found out, uh, and we will now see Yvon Sanier, I think, in the next moment in this trailer, that this city, the, the cultural capital, is surrounded by, by refugee camps. And these refugees are illegalized. 500,000 people. Yeah, around 500,000 people. 
bit south Italy, it's completely dominated by, by mafia. So illegal uh, economy and especially plantations of tomatoes and oranges and lemons. And, um, and these people are used because tomatoes, you can't, you have to take them by hand because it's, it's too the same with mandarins and, and, and orange. You really need handwork, but to pull the prices down, they use illegal work. So they use immigrants that by the politics are illegalized and there's a deal with the mafia and the big companies and I mean the usual system. And uh, and this is around Matera. And then we, we understood, okay, when we do this film in this in this iconic city, Jerusalem of world cinema, if you want, uh, we need a Jesus that is really, uh, I don't know, that can represent this figure, it can't be an actor. And uh, and then we 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 found Ivan Sanier, which is a very known activist uh, for the rights of immigrants, especially in this region, in Italy. And together with him, we made a Jesus film. And parallelly, we ma we made a campaign for the rights of uh, of of, of uh, illegalized African farm workers in South Italy, which is called uh, La Revolta della Dignità, the Revolt of Dignity. And uh, and the film tells the story of Jesus and at the same time the story of uh, of this revolt. So it's a kind of a mixed parallel uh, storyline, and I think it's quite visible. Yeah. In this Let's have a look then. C'est Golgotha. En fait, crucifié Jésus voilà. dans les films de Pasolini et voilà. Gibson. Sono un attivista per i diritti che lotta contro il caporalato, contro lo sfruttamento in agricoltura. Che cosa potete fare? Non abbiamo acqua, anzi, luce. Se voi, se noi non iniziamo a lottare per i propri diritti, per i nostri diritti, nessuno non lo farò, non lo farà a posto nostro. Se uno vuole venire con me, prenda la sua croce e mi segua. Con questo progetto è qualcosa che va al di là delle religioni. E non ti piacerebbe interpretare. Essere questa presenza visibile e invisibile. Anche la scena dei soldati dove, che picchiano Gesù, molto molto interessante, da cattolico. Paura, mal di mare? In verità vi dico, uno di voi mi tradirà. Noi non siamo un film, io organizzo le lotte. Siamo già stati sfruttati nel modo di lavoro dentro la campagna come schiavi. Dobbiamo solo dire una cosa. Dobbiamo iniziare questa nuova follia, la follia del cambiamento. Incredible, incredible project to really think about who, what would, who would Jesus be, what would he do, who would he fight, you know, and I think in one of our Siegel talks you said why you were fascinated, he said, you know, there were conflicting source material about his stories, he was a revolutionary, named a terrorist, you know, um, everybody in a way wanted to hide it, they tried not to kill him, you know, to, 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 to not make obvious, you know, what is so wrong. Um, ultimately, um, the truth came out of, of power. So, um, how was that experience um, um, for you in your work um, to be in the footsteps of these directors to try out a theater piece? Um, and uh, how did it fit in in the global realism of your ideas of theater, what it can do? Um. I mean, first of all, I di discovered the Bible through this film or the New Testament, and I was quite impressed. I mean, if I would have been the founder of the church, I would have edited this book much differently to be good propaganda, because I mean, it's really bad propaganda, because everything is told from different perspectives, as you know. Uh, it's super, con it's, it's full of contradictions. Jesus is 
shown as a very human figure. And in the end, you have this very no, known absurd situation that the son of God is saying, but my father, why did have you forsaken me? So God becomes human to then question God, no? So all this is kind of Beckett craziness. And, um, and this I really loved, to see this story that is, and you know, when you are an activist and you, and, and, and for example, what is, what is also interesting in this story that the Roman Empire is, is quite uh, aggressive and, 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 and brutal and, and in the end Jesus is crucified, but everybody, including Pontius Pilatus, they are trying to save Jesus, you know? And it's actually his uh, apostles who are his problem, no? It's Judas and it's Peter and it's, it's like, um, and when you are working as an activist and you see it really here, uh, also in the south of Italy, where the pressure of the big enterprise of the politics and of the mafia is so strong that these movements break inside because the outside pressure is so big that you find the Judas and the Petrus and the all these kind of things in every group of people. So, um, and, and, and this was for me interesting, that they would tell a revolution, but showing a revolutionary that is weak, is narcissistic, is, is like you have all these stories, you know? There's, for example, the story when, 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 when Judas decides to, to leave Jesus when they are in Mary from Bethany in, in her place, and she brings the oil to wash the head of Jesus, and then Petrus, uh, Judas says, but why don't we well, sell it for the poor? Because he's a kind of a socialist, Judas, no? And, uh, and, and Jesus says, but hey, shut up, there's only one Jesus, there are many poor. And then he continues to, to put the oil in his hair. And uh, why didn't he, I, I would just have erased this scene, you know? Because it shows a very bad side of Jesus. And this is, first of all, this is nice, that you see the potential of the Christian culture that is, and of the church, of course, that is in this, in this book, and when I was that Antigone and the Amazon, perhaps we have a trailer about it too today. I'm not sure. I think so. Um, when I was uh, together with the with the landless movement, they had a quite interesting book, occupying the Bible, so reappropriating the Bible, um, and that's exactly what we did there. We said, okay, this is the book, and we find a context, and perhaps it's my poetics in in general. We put it in this context, and this context will actualize and reappropriate it, and will show us what this book perhaps means today. You know, and of course you hope for the moment. And and what is interesting in this film, uh, because there's documentary moments, there are real moments. People are real uh, leaders, but at the same time they are playing roles, and it's a bit mixed. And many times people don't know when it's a Bible scene and when it's a a real scene because this book is so actual and of course we all hope for a moment when this book will not represent reality anymore and when we don't need a Jesus anymore or when we don't need a revolt anymore because dignity is, is, is installed you know and, and 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 that's what the film is is about at the same time you talked about the footsteps of the of the directors that did this uh, Jesus films before and especially Pier Paolo Pasolini is in, in Europe is like perhaps the director of directors. Uh, there's a lot of stories around him um, and a lot of people in Matera still alive were acting in his film. And um, yeah, he's a, he's, this film especially created a, a whole style. Uh, when it came out, everybody made jokes about it. It was a, absolutely not a success because it's also a bit sentimental, but as a, as a, as a film that is told um, uh, as a collective, uh, you see the collective movement in this film. There is, it was the first Jesus film where I think Jesus was not the most present guy. And it was, uh, and of course Enrique Razzocchi, he could not play any role afterwards because he was known over the whole globe as, as Jesus. And a uh, very funny fact, uh, when I met him to, to then uh, stage again uh, a Jesus film with him, um, um, he asked me, but where are the, the big tableaux, the cartons? And I said, which cartons? And then he said <laughs> that Pasolini was always holding the cartons with his text behind the camera, so he could read it, uh, because he's not an actor, you know? 
and, uh, and then I started preparing the cartons. Amazing, yeah, and also the idea, it's not a white Jesus, it's not a Jesus out of Oberammergau, you know, where, you know, they reenacted. It's a, a someone from uh, uh, Cameroon, well, Ivan, what, what was his? Ivan Sanier is from, from Cameroon. Cameroon, yeah, it's, it's a revolutionary in that way, I, um, I do think, and there is this anecdote, which some people say it's true, but I don't know, there's a, of an American politician who is against uh, in Spanish as second language, even in, um, in a highly Spanish population areas, and he said, if English is good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for everyone. And, um, and which shows you the appropriation um, of it, and I think this is a, a truly in, incredible piece of theater, and I guess audience members from the festival, the European that we are on the streets when you shot some of the scenes, so it was kind of a, a moving, uh, a piece of site-specific work which you then documented on film but also uh, created, as you say, events. You say we need to create events, big events. Theater should be big things. They should be noticeable. I think this is one of them. Yeah. Um, I mean, one, one, yeah. I mean, there, there, there are different spaces this film is, is in. Um, um, and one, one space is, 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 is really filmic so you have film scenes from the bible then and then we have a lot of mix with i mean two worlds one world is the world of the of the reality of this of these actors so the, the 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 reality of the camps and of the political fight and of uh, uh, of all these kind of things of melancholy of pressure uh, betrayal as as discussed and on the other side you have the the reality of all these tourists going to Matera to see the city of, of the Bible. And I remember uh, houses built by EU money for immigrants. They were built, people made their money, but they were never allowed to go in, they were never used. So um, it's an incredible um, um, document and it really shows uh, how powerful um, theater can be in that it can take a stand. Let's go to the next um, uh, trailer. to say a bit about it, Milo? Vocês sabem, nas tragédias gregas, o cor é de fato o primeiro personagem. Toen ik besloot om Antigone te spelen, dan probeerde ik te begrijpen wat die plaats van verzet inhoudt. Veel is monstelijk in de wereld. Maar niets is monsterlijker dan de mens. Each grain of earth over the body is light. That's Antigone in the Amazon. So a play we did uh, some months ago, um, last spring, or was the premiere. And that's the, we talked several times today about it. It was with, uh, produced together with the Landless Movement that, um, for example, here you see represented in the choir. So we have, uh, we made over years different uh, workshops and videos, and then we started in 2019, 2020, COVID, and then we continued in Europe, and we get, went back in 2022, 2023. Uh, to a three-year project, more or less. It was a very long project, um, and, um, um, yeah, and in, in the end, now it's touring uh, as a as a as a play in Europe, and um, um, it's a mix of, of 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 as you see of video and uh, and uh, and acting, and perhaps it's a bit comparable uh, with the new gospel project because it's uh, it's also trying to implement an antique myth. The Antigone, or book, or text, or or whatever. I mean, many people read, for example, Antigone and Jesus as parallel characters. So the the, the character of the radical no to the system. So Antigone says no to the to the 
birth of modern states somehow. So she stands for tradition and for the law of the earth and for the gods. And, and she wants to bury her brother because this is the traditional law that you would bury a, a body. And on the other side, you have Creon who, who says he's an enemy of the state, a terrorist, as you said about Jesus, so we can't bury. And that's where the conflict starts. Um, and, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that when I met the Landless Movement, which is a huge movement in, in Brazil, I think- Maybe say a word of, not everybody was here this afternoon, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 I think, the biggest social movement perhaps on the planet, but for sure in Latin America. And uh, it's a civil movement that there was the land reform in Brazil, but never realized. And they occupy land so that the land taken by the colonizers would be redistributed to the people. That's the idea of the land reform, but it was because of reasons we can imagine, never realized. So they realize it themselves by occupying land. Hundreds of thousands of people, right? Everybody. Hundreds of thousands of families, millions of people, and uh, huge, huge, huge parts of lands. They created what we call in the play a nation inside the nation. So it's really reappropriating the land, and they produce in a biological way very effective. They have their schools, they have their theaters, they have they have tradition of uh, of, of staging plays, and a, uh, a big tradition of choir work. Um, uh, for the demonstrations and for everything. Um, so a choir is like 50 people or 100 or... Um, and it depends. It can be a lot. It can be 10. It can be 5. Um, it, uh, it, it depends from the, from the need. And uh, we created, um, I think it's perhaps 40 people uh, that we had in the choir. And this choir is mi a mix of... Because there was one... Uh, iconic massacre in the north in the Amazon uh, that happened on the on these streets called I mean this system of streets called the Transamazonica. So these streets that go through the forest that was constructed to actually destroy the forest. No, um, and uh, and uh, on that street happened the massacre. The military police killed yeah some dozens of people from the landless movement. And since then, every year they would occupy the street and make a ceremony there. And then they invited us to, 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 to stage the play there. And we said, okay, we would reenact the massacre together with the survivors of the massacre and young activists, but they are also the choir in the, uh, in the, in the, in the play. And this mix, a bit similar to the, to the new gospel, made the parallel storyline of, on the one hand, the actual story of, uh, of Brazilian activism from the landless movement, the question of the indigenous people, uh, and on the other side, um, yeah, this, this this story by by Sophocles, which is on the on the birth of European theater somehow, um, um, and uh, and to bring this together, and um, that's that's uh, that's how this play uh, functions. I mean, uh, famously. I hope I remember right. You said you know at your uh, Ghent manifestos, you know, next that every s different languages have to be on stage. Uh, the play has to be performed outside this theater in this city. It has to travel to at least three different countries. You also said you can at least you shouldn't use more than thirty or forty percent of the original text. Um, also here you applied this. Tell us a bit about um, we talked about briefly the afternoon. You rewrote a classic, right? You in a, a serious way with with your diverse um, 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 cast, which are actors from Ghent, uh, they are uh, activists, Brazilian artists, uh, people from the Augusto Boal world, um, who you are also part of the land movement, an interesting connection. So um, how did you approach the text? Um, as a... As a I mean, first of all, we were we were reflecting together with the landless movement or with the former dramaturg of Augusto Boal what could be the the topic, and you know, disappearing bodies, bodies not buried, etc. This is in the in the in the social movement of, of of Brazil is omnipresent, especially in the north in in Pará, which is the state where we meet, which is a extremely violent state because you have the big plantations uh, there. And uh, and and we decided for uh, for Antigone because it 
linked in many ways to what was interesting to them from the form of the choir to the question of the body to the question of of, uh, of resistance and so on and, uh, and the question of land of course and um, and then we started to um, to use snippets of the text to develop choir pieces and to uh, to develop scenes um, and other parts are completely not from the Antigone, but somehow inspired by, for example, there's Theresias the Prophet, um, that in a in a in a kind of a by Julian Beck, right, played in the. Oh no, he was the Oedipus. Sorry, he was yeah, he was Oedipus, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, 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 we asked we asked uh, first we had Ceseusu because he's a, he's really the the, the 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 father of Brazilian theatre. Uh, but then, um, and Ceseusu died, and and then we asked uh, Ayrton Krenak, which is the you could say the Jean Paul Sartre somehow of of uh, of Brazil, of indigenous Brazil, and he played the Theresias, so this prophet, and like a lot of scenes, we try to to find um, a parallel, and I think it was the first sentence here in the in the trailer saying uh, there is no difference between myth and reality. Once there was an Antigone, once there was a Creon, once there was a Polynetes, once there was a civil war. So, and parallelly we tell the story about these people dead on the street on that day in uh, in April 1996 when this, this, this massacre happened. And you had a Polynetes, a young man who was killed. We saw, we saw him, I mean, an actor playing him in this, in this, in this trailer. And, uh, and that's how by, by, and that's often it goes over years. So you have one uh, segment on the other, on the other. And what in the end is often my plays on stage is kind of, you could say the, the notebook of the making of uh, a group of people who went to Brazil to put together with the landless movement a version of Antigone and what happened to them and what they think now about it and what etc. So this is the this is the, the the way of telling the story. Amazing. Potentially even coming to the scope or maybe not, maybe it will be um, the Medea. I just want to just to put it into context again as we all know that if you go to Columbia University as a directing school well, it's 10 or 15 years, you, give, you have to do the Bakai, you know, and uh, which is way too big, way too hard to do. But this is then, and then you put on the white, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, cloth or something. We do a Greek play, and then you see about acting, often they're all, all the same age. So, you know, so just think about adapting a classic. What does it mean in the time we live? How do you do that? And what a concept that really is to say, we go out, I go to Brazil, I go to the world, that is not part of our world, but on whose blood, in a way, we live. We, our comfort, as you say, we, the more comfortable we are, the more brutal it is for other people. Heiner Müller said in some of his plays, you open a fridge, blood should come out, you know, and um, so in a way you confront um, um, the invisible um, and the reality, and, um, but because you say it could be shown, it could be put in a context, it can also be changed. It is actually not fate. It's not God given. There is a, a progressive justice and it will come. And you mentioned in your book that perhaps we are still in a state of pre human. We haven't, maybe it will come in 300 years and 500 if this planet survives. But theater is part of that change and is truly, um, truly, truly inspiring um, what you did there to, to think about it. And as a game, and theater is a game, and mankind's perhaps greatest. Uh, achievement is to create games, great games, and there's soccer and ping pong, this, and all, they're all great, but I think theater is the most fascinating. It is a game, it's a play, and but you can see things from different sides. There are contradictory statements you can give, and audiences to ultimately will have to make up their minds, but it's an extraordinary uh, project. Let's go to the next one, which might be the last one. You, this you opened a week ago, right? Or two? So incredible. You want to talk something up front, maybe? Yeah. So this is. Uh, I mean, that's an interesting piece because it's. Uh, the, I, I also here. I don't know which uh, trailer we will see from all the trailers, but this is an opera uh, we did based on one case 
um, I, I met you in the Congo Tribunal, not the one we saw in the movie, but another one that happened um, two years ago. And there was uh, an accident of, a, of an ACID truck. You need ACID, uh, sulfuric acid, sulfuric, you know, like a uh, yeah, yeah, like like to, to 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 bring the material, the raw material, out of the stone, and it goes faster than the traditional methods with water and everything. But this is too slow for the industry, so they they use this. And then one of these trucks has an accident, falls on the city, on the little village of Col uh, Kabwe, which is close to Kolvesi, and kills and falls on a, on a minibus and kills 20 people slowly. So it drips on them over 12, 13 years, uh, sorry, hours. And, uh, and then, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, but it becomes now uh, the, the the time frame now changes because then the, the the rain starts and the acid goes into the symmetry, and uh, and in when we did this this tribunal also the, the priest of the village came and he said since this happened I can't talk to the dead anymore because even the souls disappeared. So I I uh, and we talked to a mother who lost her child and another man who lost his legs and so on. And um, and, and then I was asked by, 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 by the Grand Théâtre de Genève, the, the Geneva Opera, which is one of the big, you know, really old style opera houses in, in Europe, I, uh, if I wanted to stage an opera. And I said, if I have the choice, I would highlight this case um, because it's completely invisible, it's random. Um, um, and uh, and never nobody will talk about it. And then we we searched for a a team of people. Um, so there's one Serge Kakuchi, one uh, uh, incredible singer uh, who who is from Colvesi, a, a city very close. Fiston Van Zamuchila, Booker Prize uh, uh, nominee. He 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 is from another city, Lubumbashi, which is, I mean. Capri is really in the middle of these two people. And I connected to them and Hector Parra, we talked about him. Um, composer. The composer, and together we did this uh, opera and we staged it in Geneva, um, mixed with, with films we made there with these people. And I remember the moment when, because based on what they said, Fiston was writing the libretto. And at one point, I, I don't know if it's in this trailer, but at one point, uh, together with Serge Kakuchi, we went back. And then he was singing to these people the, the, the what they said in the tribunal as arias. And, um, and this was really, for me, the one of the most meaningful moments of, I mean, in this little world of what can art mean as a, as a, as a transcendence or as a, as a moment when you, when you give beauty and dignity to something that is just a random accident in world economy, like this accident. And um, yeah, and uh, perhaps just that you understand why we had to do it in Geneva. Geneva is the, is the biggest, uh, to say, the, the marketplace for raw materials in the world. And the whole richness of Switzerland is, 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 is well, so Switzerland is based on it. And Glencore is a Swiss uh, company. Glencore is on the basis of this accident because it happened on a mine of or a concession of Glencore. And Glencore is the biggest company of Switzerland. It's based close to Geneva and is, uh, uh, I mean, close to Geneva in the terms of Switzerland. So, um, and um, <laughs> and and uh, they make more than two hundred billions profit every year. So it's more than whole Switzerland together. And it's, it's like, and, and this context made it logic to me to bring Geneva and Capri together in this, in this, in this opera. And yeah, that's the story. Incredible, instead of doing La Bohème or um, a beautiful uh, Figaro, um, you said, you know, I'll bring this to, uh, to a place, um, to a truth that nobody really, they might know about, it's invisible, everybody knows it, but nobody, Nobody um, talks about it. If I remember right, in a book you say uh, to develop such a minor project, it costs 10 to 12 years. It's most probably 10 to 15, 20 billion dollars. Within three years, you have to get the money back from the company who invested it. Otherwise, it will not make sense. It will economically 
um, not uh, be worth it. And there is no time for schools, for universities, for thinking about the people who live there. It's, it's brutal. Um, it's a naked uh, capitalism, as you also quoted before. And you use theater that at least for a moment to give the dignity. Uh, you, at the end of the book, you talk and say, theater might be a window you open for the moment to see eternity. Even for that sh short moment, you see some kind of a of a truth Kleist writes about in his marionette observations. He said, there is, we were out of paradise a long time ago, but perhaps theater is a little tiny back door that opens up and for a time, you spend time in there as a revolt or then maybe as a enjoyment of a dignity. But let's have a look. And again, this is a, a week old, incredible, uh, so that we have Milo here giving 10 days, uh, uh, sorry, three days more. Um, so um, let's have a look at it. Quand j'étais quand j'étais jeune, pour me débrouiller à trouver un peu de sous, moi j'ai travaillé euh, dans le dans, dans, dans les mines. Une fois, je travaillais là-bas, une goutte d'acide est tombée là sur sur mon bras. Ça m'a marqué parce que là, la cicatrice quand je la regarde, je vois cet acide là et se retrouver à travers cette cette opéra justice au milieu de cet accident, ces tragique accident aussi causé aussi par par l'acide. Pour moi, il y a ce concours, je dirais, de de la réalité de de cette histoire qui me bouleverse dans ma chair même et dans mon sang. En fait, il n'y a pas eu de justice. Et il n'y a pas une justice qui existe. Alors, il y a vraiment quelque chose qui est, pour moi, choquant. Si on prend ce petit événement complètement oublié, pas entrer dans la justice, pas entrer dans les médias, c'est comme un des mille accidents horribles qui se passent dans, dans l'industrie mondialisée. Et justice euh, se focalise sur un point très concret, un accident qui est passé ici, dans ce village, Caboué, un accident d'un camion d'acide qui percute un bus. Après, toute l'acide se répand dans les villages. 20, 20 et quelques morts. La grande entreprise qui, à la fin, a causé ce, ce crime, en fait, qui n'a jamais réparé ce crime, est la plus grande entreprise suisse. En fait. Alors, la richesse de la Suisse repose sur l'injustice qui existe ici. Et de le montrer au cœur des du capitalisme financier, ça donne tellement de sens, en fait. Incredible, uh, incredible concept. New, new, new music, we were talking about new music. New about music, new fantastic, music. yeah. So it was all all written and the libretto music all uh, within two years you created the opera or yeah I mean I was I was now sitting to to Yun the, this this afternoon and uh, when I was together with Hector um, for me this was completely incredible how he he wrote for an orchestra of sixty instruments and a choir of forty people and seven singers and and uh, and everything happened in his head and he wrote it down on so many lines and uh, it's really it's it's completely incredible so um yeah for me uh, it's uh yeah it's uh it's, it's 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 yeah and i mean of course i mean the the, the work i did as a and this is the nice side of opera as a as a i made the concept and then i made a, a kind of a treatment and i i staged it but um, compared to the to the to the composer, it's really it's uh, it's 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 super easy, and um, yeah, that's that's incredible. And um, yeah, so my 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 respect for composing is uh, is really immense. I never saw a work that is so, I mean, time consuming, exhausting, needs so much of talent. I, I uh, saw Hector working for one year, 16 hours every day. So that's, uh, and in the end he was, I mean, today I was joking about, and then in 10 minutes we changed the ending, etc. And he was open to all these kind of things still. So it's, uh, he's the most humble person I met. And um, and the same with Serge Kakuchi, the same with, with the, 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 the 
Deliberatist, äh, Fiston, Manza Mochila, who is on stage. Um, what it's, yeah, it's really, it was for me uh, an incredible experience to do this opera. And, um, and, and that's why, as we discussed this afternoon, it's completely absurd that we play this four times in Geneva because the machine is too big and then two times in Austria and that's it. So six times. Um, of course, we film it and, and everything, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it is in opera. Incredible. And, and I think it's a good strategy to document. I mean, visual artists are so good at documenting their work. Uh, theater makers don't do it. I think you are um, a role model to also have, a, to have something uh, that you document. You write in the book, you're most happy when you are in a state of panic when you don't know how things are going to work out because the challenges in the morning when you wake up and have to get something on film. Um, how do you deal with the panic? How do you deal with the exhaustion? How do you deal also of course, the melancholy of making art? You know, how, um, how do you deal with all these uh, um, criticism of all the uh, uh, moralists who say, how you're not allowed to do that, like Schlingensief and Nushtin and all that? How how do you care what motivates you how do you carry that through yeah i mean the the um, um i i think that the older i get the less um i somehow care about it um not because i don't understand it or because i but because I understood that it is somehow unavoidable, that um, that the, I mean, for example, the criticism. I mean, there is many positive side of it. There is many negative sides of it, but it will all the time happen. So um, I just accepted it somehow. But still, um, I mean, it was because you were naming the name Schlingensief. Of course, one negative critique is you will remember your whole life, and ten positive you forget immediately. And this is the, I think, the normal human uh, thing, no? And um, yeah, and I, I think, of course, you find the, the, the fun and the beauty, for example, in the collaboration with Serge Kakuchi or Kochak, who is with the guitar there, or Titus Engel, who was the, the director and the singers and the choir and the, all these people that were involved in the project, and this is the happiness of it. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, you know, my, my, I, I also have another side of my work and that's the curating as artistic director, for example, of this, this festival. And this is more difficult because there, I mean, you as a curator somehow, and you might know that you have mostly the negative sides of it. You have much less this, this, this happiness of creation. And um, and if there you don't have a good reason to do it, then it's too exhausting, and you would not you would not continue. So I I think um, yeah, institutional work is in a way much more exhausting and uh, let's say melancholy producing than than uh, artistic work. So because always when I it's really funny, but when I when I only enter a space of theater or of opera, or if I only meet some people working in the field to produce i'm immediately happy and i immediately forget everything and i'm i'm really all the melancholy is gone immediately so um but of course this doesn't happen when you enter the the bureau of your institution so <laughs> uh, voila <laughs> what is the first thing you ever saw in theater if you remember what is the first I was I was joking today about Les Femmes Savantes of Molière, but it was the first play I remember I saw in an outside. Um, um, I grew up in Switzerland, and when you grow up in Switzerland, the, the closest way uh, country to go to holidays is always France. So you go to France, and there they always stage Molière in summer theaters outside. And then even if you are six years old, you would go to see Molière, and you don't understand it at all. But I remember that I have seen Moliere in an outside space. Uh, I mean, you go to bullfights and you go to Moliere. And this is the, the remember two Remember the play? 
Elephant Savant. The, 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 yeah, yeah, one. it was this one. Yeah, yeah, strangely. And that's why I remember and why I read it later and why I was always interested by this play, which is a not so often played play, but it's not one like, I don't know, the, the known one, you know? So it's... it's uh, Interesting, it was outside and in another country. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, quite um, quite something. We are close to the end or coming to an end. What, uh, so if you want to share or what is what are, what do you have uh, as ideas for production was already scheduled or what are you thinking about that you might not even have told anyone, not even yourself. Um, what, 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 what are you planning to do after these incredible projects? I cannot imagine what the pressure must be also or the, I mean, I don't have any uh, very strange, incredible project that is planned. I mean, one one project I would like to to tell you is because we we we, we saw now this this Greek tragedies. For it, uh, we didn't see Orestes in Mosul, but we saw um, Antigone. And talking about outside theater, I was once walking through a park in the very morning in Paris and uh, seeing a play by Shakespeare. And um, it was so early in the morning, now I'm tired, but it was morning, it was six or seven. And uh, I was stopping and I was listening to it and I was understanding every word of Shakespeare. And normally I have no idea what they are talking about because it's, it's like lyricism and you know, so it's difficult to get it. In you know what happens, but you don't really understand. And then I said, ah, wow, if this is the moment when I understand the classics, we should do a festival where we play the classics in the morning outside at six. <laughs> and, um, and that's what we, what we do in the spring. We, we play all the Greek tragedies in the morning at six, one after the other, it's 32. Um, um, so hopefully the Romans burned down the uh, Bibliothek of Alexandria, so it's only 32 left. And, um, yeah, and that's that's a project that uh, that yeah for me always was a dream to do, and now we Ghent or in Vienna in Ghent in the city of Ghent in different spaces. It starts in April. And I see no electricity, right? It's outside, and it's there is of course as always in my dogmatic world uh, there is rules, so no no electricity and blah blah blah, no etc. Two hours of of rehearsals only and so on, and um, um, but you can use the text. But no comedies. No what? <laughs> no comedies, no Greek comedies. Yeah, it was, a, of course, a discussion if we should include the comedies, but then it becomes uh, it becomes really too much. Incredible. Um, normally, we would stay for Q&A, but Milo is with us since 4 o'clock, and 4.30 he's flying back tomorrow. He arrived basically on Monday. He stayed a day longer to be with us and also to share his work with you who are in the audience. And ultimately, this is not about Milo. It's not about you know, uh, what, what he does, something speaks through him. And it's for you who's sitting in the audience or for the audience members who see and watch the play. So this is, you know, for you. So I hope it's a contribution to your world. And I think what he says, go outside, connect to different people. Don't be in your safe space. It's all dramaturgical advice for our own lives, I think. You know, where can wh what moves us? Like when you see we're part of the massacre, of course, it's a tragic one. But you also talk in your book, there's the banality of evil, he said. But there's also the banality of the good. You don't have to be a superhero. You know, you you can do something. You can contribute and invite people to your homes or go up to other places. So I think there is a lot that is deeply meaningful to our lives. Besides, that is also what Milo's work is. It's really good theater, and he said this this afternoon. His ideology he also puts in a book. When when he does theater, he also does theater. So it's a quite uh, an important. Um, um, lesson also to have. So um, thank you guys for coming, taking time. Thanks to HowlRound, everybody, uh, for Graham and uh, Bailey up there. But most of all, um, Milo, thank you. And all our respect for this uh, incredible work, your contribution to global theater, and in this concert of theater makers who have come before you and are working now and will come after you who think that we are doing a work that has to change the world. We have to show how the world really is, but it was a call not only to action, but to be part of it. So really, I would say a big applause for Milo. Thank you. Thank you.